Uh, so we'll um, move forward. So you may have noticed the, the first half of today was about some complex and uh, chronic pain. We're going to move towards procedural pain and acute pain for the afternoon. Um, and first up is Brandon Wong, who's an independent learning project uh, student from the University of New South Wales, who I've been uh, supervising for the past 12 months. Uh, Brandon's been looking at post-discharge pain in children following appendicectomy and tonsillectomy. Um, and so welcome, Brandon. Thank you very much for that introduction, Jordan. And it is my great opportunity to be able to present on this topic to you guys today. So let's start. In the talk today, I'll just be talking about what short-stay surgery is and giving you guys a brief overview on that. And then we'll be looking at the challenges we face when children go home and get discharged from hospital after short-stay surgery, including the research that we did and some of the findings that we found while during the year of research at the Sydney Children's Hospital. And at the end, we'll be looking at future directions in where can we go from there. And so what is short-stay surgery? Well, short-stay surgery is a kind of surgical procedure that aims to discharge the patient following their surgical procedure within 24 to 72 hours so that the patient can manage their recovery within the home environment. And it's being increasingly used within the high-volume planned pediatric procedure all over Australia such as tonsillectomies and appendicectomies. And in Australia, with the, between 2013 and 2015 alone, there were over 86,000 tonsillectomies and over 22,000 laparoscopic appendectomies in the Australian pediatric population alone. So that's quite a lot of surgical procedures. And so why is short-stay surgery being used increasingly all around Australia? Well, there's many benefits to it, such as less disruption to the family, so you allow the, fam um, the children, the patient, and the family to go home a lot sooner, and so they don't have to uproot their entire life to come into hospital just so that they can watch the child recover from their surgery. And it reduces the risk of hospital-acquired infections and other hospital-related complications for the children while they are because of the reduced stay in hospital, and also increases the bed availability for patients who actually need the bed more, and as such, reduce the burden on healthcare. And finally, it's preferred by parents so that's why we're using it more. But the bad thing about it is that children are being discharged from hospital while they're still experiencing sometimes significant amounts of pain. And pain has been documented all over literature to cause various adverse effects within children and their parents alike. And in children, physical adverse effects include impaired healing, impaired nutrition, and impaired sleep, and could also cause, lead to psychological upset and potential trauma. And then the parents cause anxiety, stress, sleep disturbances, and make them take additional time off work, which could reduce their overall productivity. And so one of the challenges we face as our healthcare physicians is that we don't have a clear idea of what's going on once they get discharged from hospital outside of our care. And so in order to better, get a better understanding of that, over the year, Jordan and I, as well as a few of our colleagues, created an app that allows us to, that, to put on the patient's smartphones that allow the patient to log their own pain ratings and also allow the parent to log various different functional outcomes, includes, including the perceived pain that they think their children is facing. And what we, we recruited 57 child and parent pairs and had them completed a survey a day for 10 days following their discharge from the home environment, out from the hospital environment, I mean. And after collecting that data together, we got, managed to get a better idea of what happens during the post-discharge environment. And so, because pain is so subjective, in our study, we used a combination of, we used two different pain scales that are validated throughout the literature in order to better, gain a better assessment of the child's pain. So, one of the tools we use is the FACES pain scale, which is shown on the screen over there. And this allows the children to visually relate their pain to one of the faces on their scale and allows us to better quantify their pain. And the second one we used was a numeric pain rating scale, which is a simple one to 10 pain scale that allows the children to rate their pain, that the pain that they're experiencing at that time. And so we pulled all that data together and plotted the trajectory of the children's pain over the 10 day period that they were sent home following their discharge from hospital. 
and we found that 71% of append appendicectomy patients and 59% of tonsillectomy patients do achieve full pain recovery within that 10-day period. However, on the flip side, 29% of appendicectomy patients and 41% of tonsillectomy patients do, ex do not have a complete pain resolution after the 10 days following discharge. This is a significant proportion of children who still experience pain 10 days after they've gone home from hospital. And furthermore, because we were able to get the child's self-reported pain rating and the parent's pain rating, we were able to compare the difference between the parent's perception of the child's pain as well as the child's perception. And so by using the, PP, the parent, parental post-operative pain measure, short form, as well as the parental numeric pain scale, we were able to compare the pain between the child and the parents. And we found that the, child's, the parental pain rating, perceived pain rating of their child was consistently lower than what the child reported their own pain to be. And so this is one of the, one of the issues that we may face during the post-discharge setting in that the parents are one of the, key, one of the first line treatment providers for the child's pain in the post-surgical setting. And if they were to consistently underestimate their child pain, this could lead to inadequate treatment and uh, complicate, which could complicate their recovery down the line. And so we also had a look at uh, functional, functional limitations that occur in the post-discharge setting. And how we assess functional limitation was that we used the simple three-point scale um, to, to allow the parents to gauge the amount of limitations that their child is facing and also get the parents and the child to log various lifestyle disturbances that they may have faced throughout their post-discharge post -discharge recovery experience. And in terms of functional limitation, we found that a significant amount of the children do experience some form of limitation in the, at the end of the 10-day period following their discharge from hospital. And this lines up with study, another study in the literature which found that Functional limitation persisting after their discharge from hospital can persist for up to two weeks following their discharge, and it's significantly correlated with pain. And so other lifestyle dis um, disruptions caused by the pain from their surgical procedure include absence from school, where tonsillectomy patients miss nine days of school on average, and appendicectomy patients miss an average of four days of school. And this was positively correlated with the amount of pain that they're experiencing throughout the day-to-day -day basis, which means that the pain experienced in the post-discharge setting can limit the child from returning back to the school environment and returning back to their normal routine. And furthermore, we also found that there was an interference to, the child experienced more interferences to sleep with, with a higher pain rating. And all of this would reduce, um, would impede on recovery and cause further complications due to pain down the line. And one last thing we had to look at was the parents, the number of days off that the parents took above and beyond what they were planned to take prior to coming into surgery. And what we found was that parents were consistently taking less unexpected day off additional to what they have already decided to take off because of their children's pain. And furthermore, and so, from this, we, we hypothesized that parents were consistently underestimating the overall pain recovery experience that their child are facing, and such get caught off guard when their child are actually recovering from surgery and thus have to take extra days to take care of them. And this, is, this goes back to the parents' uh, underestimation of the child pain, pain rating. And another complications that, another issue that we face a post-discharge pain setting is that parents are consistently under-medicating their child. In our study, we found that parents were only giving their child medications a median of three days out of the 10-day period that we, we conducted our study for, which means that seven of those days, the child will have to face the pain without any help, without any medication, any simple analgesic such as paracetamol or ibuprofen, and such as a result will lead to an increased pain experience during those seven days. And we thought that there might have been a few reasons for it. In, in the literature, we found that potential reasons include low information retention, in that a study done by Fortier et al. found that on, only 48% of parents do retain their information 
once the information given to them regarding analgesic, once they get sent home from hospital. And another study by Hagadi et al. found that parents do have negative attitudes towards pain medication, fearing that it might cause addiction or negative adverse effects, and even going as far as to believe that their child will recover better if they don't get pain medication. And so all of these compl complications of are associated with the parents' attitudes or medication and something that we will need to definitely address in order to improve the child's overall pain experience. And so where can we go from here? Because there is a number of different, different um, outcomes that could correlate and that could possibly link to the child's post-operative pain outcome, we'd like to try and identify these pain outcomes, such as the parents' attitude towards medication or potentially anxiety, baseline anxiety, and see how they see if they're able to predict the pain outcomes that the child experienced after the post after they get discharged home from surgery. And as a result of that, direct out intervention therapy in order to address the, these issues. So for example, give better education provision to the parents in order to change their medication attitude, attitudes towards medication, or provide better information so that they can retain information better. And so, in conclusion, we found that short-stay surgery is being increasingly used within the pediatric setting, and pain in the post-discharge pain does persist for 10 days or more following their discharge from hospital. And the, the pain does limit their functional activity and cause various lifestyle disruptions, such as sleep disturbances and also absence from school. And one of the important things we found was that parents consistently underestimate their child's pain and also underestimate the overall pain experience that the child goes through during the recovery period post-discharge. And as a result of that, they tend to administer less analgesic over the recovery period and take more days off than they expect to. And so future interventions should try and address these, these preconceived perceptions that the parents have cause them to underestimate their child's pain and underestimate the pain experience overall, and hopefully allow them to better manage their children post-operatively and lead to, lead to better pain outcome. And any questions? Some references? Might hold the questions until the end, uh, if that's all right, uh, and just get the uh, speakers to do their talks, and then we can have a, a discussion at the end. Thank you. Uh, so next up is uh, Laura, Laura Burgoyne, who is uh, the lead of the acute pain service here at Children's Hospital in Adelaide, and uh, she's going to talk about a topical topic: out of sight and out of mind. Uh, should we do blocks for day surgery? Thank. You. Thank you, Jordan. So if you're contemplating using regional anesthesia in day surgery for children, you have to ask yourself the following questions. Is it safe? Does it work? It's a lot of effort. Are we going to bother if it doesn't do anything? What's the role of ultrasound? Ultrasounds used for everything, but it's, they're expensive machines to maintain. Is, is there any value for using them for regional anesthetics? And what about elastomeric pumps? Are these safe devices to send patients home with? So day, day stay surgery, the important difference is the kids are going home. They're not going to be supervised by our vigilant nurses. Um, is it safe to send patients home after we've stuck needles into them? There have been some, a couple of large studies that have set out to answer this question. And this is a really uh, great study that was um, from, the from a French group and that was published in 2010. And the, um, it was a one-year prospective study of children having regional anaesthetics in a French language uh, society. So mostly French doctors um, in French hospitals, but also some from Canada and Belgium. And they did a huge number of regional anaesthetics on children. Over 30,000 regional procedures were performed in this one year period. Um, and the really interesting thing they found was that after one, um, after one year of following these children up, they did not have one single complication that persisted beyond one year and no medico-legal concerns reported. 
they had some um, a, a wide range of minor problems, which I won't go into, but of the more major problems, they had two colonic punctures, both noted at the time uh, that they were inserted and um, didn't lead to any long-term outcome. And there were five nerve injuries that were suspected, but also did not lead to any long-term outcome. So crossing the Atlantic, the Ameri American group have done a similar, although smaller study. And this is a group calling themselves the Pediatric Regional Anesthesia Network that comes under the auspices of the Society for Pediatric Anesthesia. And they did a similar multi-institutional prospective study um, of almost 15,000 regional anesthetics in children over approximately a three year period between about um, in uh, around 2007. And they also found there were no deaths and no complications beyond three months in any of their patients. So what does that mean for us who insert um, regional anaesthetics in children? If we take the French study that um, only one patient had a complication after one month, what that means is that if you're doing one block per month, you would need 2,500 years of anaesthesia before you would get one complication beyond one month, or 83 anaesthetists their whole lifetime. If you're doing them a bit more frequently, so perhaps two a week, that's still um, 10 and it's just lifetime of practice before you get a, um, a complication that persists beyond one month. But um, bad stuff does happen. And if you want to know that, um, want to know about that, you have to look at the case studies that have been written up about um, when things have gone wrong with regional anaesthetics. Um, a 14-year-old boy having a single-shot ilioinguinal uh, block for a spermatic vein ligation, presented with discharge from his incision site. It was noted that there was a colonic a puncture um, at the time of the procedure, um, and he came back to hospital with discharge. He had to have uh, multiple procedures, IV antibiotics, and a fairly prolonged admission, but it did get better. Um, a six-year-old boy was reported after having a caudal block with sacral osteomyelitis. No surgery was required, however, he did have to have a prolonged hospitalisation and IV antibiotics. Um, a nine-year-old boy having a caudal for uh, emergency scrotal exploration was written up because he developed a foot drop, which only partially resolved. So he had a long-term nerve injury. And this was an interesting case because um, it was thought that the block was not the primary cause in that the needle didn't cause the damage, but he spent a long period immobile um, in the ward after the, um, after the surgery, and it was felt that the prolonged period of immobility resulted in a sciatic nerve, partial sciatic nerve injury. So it's not always what we do, it's it maybe the way we look after our patients or other factors. So do they work? Do regional anaesthesia for day surgery uh, work? Um, many block suitable procedures are not day case material. Um, many blocks haven't been investigated that well. Um, for example, there have been um, situations where groups have looked at um, different local anaesthetic concentrations to see if they improved outcome when no one's actually shown that that block actually improves outcome itself. Um, likewise, some groups have looked at whether putting the block before or after the surgery improves the outcome for a certain operation and a certain block, and no group's ever shown that the block itself improves the outcome. Um, and lot, most studies don't look beyond the immediate recovery period. This is a, um, a, um, a study that was published in Pediatric Anesthesia, which was a, um, a review where they looked at rectus sheath and transversus abdominis plane blocks. Um, these are blocks of the anterior abdominal wall, usually um, performed with ultrasound guidance and single shot, so the needle goes in, local anaesthetic gets injected, the needle comes out. Um, and they're simple and very wide, fairly simple to, to um, perform and fairly widely used. And this group looked at um, a, a range of different um, uh, procedures. And uh, this is a forest plot. So the, the zero point means that there was no difference between the block and conventional care. And you can see the one, two, three, four, seven studies, six, six studies. Um, and then the, the diamond down the bottom is the summed data from those six studies. And so what this um, forest plot shows is that 
there is, um, and this is looking at um, morphine consumption in the six to eight hours after the block or the performed or the blocks not performed after these surgeries. And what this um, forest plot shows is that there is a reduction of about 0.02 to 0.03 milligrams per kilogram of morphine consumption in the six to eight hours after surgery when a block is performed as compared to when a block is not performed. Um, half of you are sitting there adding up what that means. What that means is in a 50 kilogram person, that's a reduction in morphine consumption of about one to 1.5 milligrams. I personally wouldn't bother putting a block in for that. So even though there's a statistically significant difference in um, uh, opiate consumption, I would argue that's not a clinically important difference. They also did a same forest plot for reduction in pain scores. Um, and they found a reduction in pain scores over the same period of 0.7. So that's 0.7 in a 1 to 10 scale. Okay, so that's a clinic, that is a statistically significant difference. However, once again, I would say that's not um, a, clin a clinically relevant um, difference in my book. Um, this is a, um, a similar review study looking at caudals versus local anaesthetics for inguinal surgery in children. And once again, looking at the use of rescue analgesia in the early period. And in this group of um, studies, they found that there was actually no difference in the use of rescue analgesia when caudals were performed compared to when regional infiltration, which is a much simpler um, technique is used. So once again, not desperately convincing. However, is it, are they completely pointless? Um, I would say no, there have been some lovely studies that have shown that there have, have been um, a difference in outcome. This is a French study where they compared, um, they took 60 children and randomised them into two groups and put um, wrist blocks into half of the children and not into the other half for minor orthopaedic surgery on the hand. And the children who didn't get block, so the children who did get blocks um, did not get opioid, and the children who didn't get blocks got managed with opioid um, as their analgesic. And what they found was that the risk block patients had less pain, less vomiting, and net discharge criteria earlier. So that study clearly demonstrated that the block was useful, um, and um, they found that pain after discharge was similar. So does ultrasound make a difference? Should we even bother using it for regional anaesthesia in children? Um, with regard to efficacy, it's in some way a moot point because lots of blocks only get put in because we have ultrasound. Um, we don't put tap blocks in or rectus sheath blocks in unless we use ultrasound because it kind of can't see where you're going. So it's not, um, it's not really a question as to whether you're going to use it or not. Most people uh, would no longer put uh, blocks into the infra, the supraclavicular area without the use of ultrasound guidance. Um, there's been a study that showed when ilioinguinal blocks were performed that ultrasound resulted in a more successful outcome than when ultrasound wasn't used. Um, when femoral blocks are inserted with ultrasound, they possibly last longer and require less local anaesthetic to work, at least in, in some studies. Um, however, supraclavicular blocks haven't found to be more successful when ultrasound is used as comp uh, compared to nerve stimulating, which was what we used to do before ultrasound was widely used. They're not useful for caudals, so there was a little phase when people were using ultrasound to put caudal blocks in, and now most people don't bother because it doesn't make any difference to outcome. What about safety? Surely when we can see what we're doing better, they are safer. Well, um, we have to look to the adult literature for this. There's not enough paediatric data to answer this question in many situations. Um, and what the, um, this adult study uh, review study found was that when they looked at post-operative neurological symptoms, so post-operative neurological symptoms are actually relatively common. So in some studies, up to 20% of patients have some numbness or tingling or burning after their block, which goes away quite quickly. And that's um, a useful surrogate marker for nerve damage because we think that some of those patients go along go on to having long-term problems. But when um, we use ultrasound guidance, they haven't been uh, a reduction in post-operative neurological symptoms. Um, but there probably is a reduced incidence of local anaesthetic systemic toxicity, at least in adults. 
What about elastomeric pumps? Should we be should we be using these for day cases? We are certainly in our hospital using these um, reasonably extensively now for inpatients. Um, when I was in the US, we did from time to time send patients home with elastomeric pumps, which are um, infu infusing local anaesthetic um, where we've placed a local anaesthetic catheter. Excuse me, wasn't supposed to happen. Um, a single study from the US of over 1,000 paediatric out outpatients with continuous peripheral nerve blocks showed that although they have a fairly high rate of, of trivial problems or minor problems, that they had um, a very low or non-existent rate of serious problems and this potential serious problems were all fairly quickly averted by cl closing the, um, clipping the uh, pump off so they couldn't could no longer infuse. So what do we know, what do we not know? It's probably easier to say what we don't know. We don't know much about smaller patients. All those studies I mentioned um, had fairly small numbers of patients um, in the under 10 age group um, and very, very small numbers of the uh, very small patients. And all the indicators are that our smaller patients have higher rates of complications. Um, there is not, probably not a lot of data for certain individual blocks. A lot of those studies, once again, um, were, uh, had very large volumes of, um, for example, the catheter study, 50% of those patients were femoral blocks. So we actually have small numbers, we have very small numbers for um, upper limb blocks and, um, and often the information comes from just one centre. So is regional anaesthesia for day surgery in children safe? Well, I would say yes, but let's not get complacent. In the last 20 years, we've spent a lot of time looking at aspects of safety. We've looked at um, what we put in those blocks, whether we put glucose or not. Um, we look at infection control. We look at the cleaning solutions we've used, and we've we've um, really had a, um, made great strides in safety. And I think we can't just get complacent and say, oh, look, none of them have complications. I think we should listen. We should remember the lessons that we've already learned and not get complacent. Do they work sometimes? Yes, but we need better data and perhaps um, not, they're not, um, as a, um, there's not as much data as you might think. Um, the role of ultrasound, I'm not really sure, but I'm sure we'll be using it. Um, and what about elastomeric pumps? I'd say uh, yes, if you game. My experience is they are quite labour intensive, but it's early data says that we can probably send patients home if that's what we want to do. Um, and I'd just like to make an announcement whoever, for anyone who I haven't already spoken to and that it looks like we'll be commencing a one-year pilot um, of a paediatric chronic pain service at the Women's and Children's Hospital um, in the middle of this year. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Laura. Um, so moving on to uh, procedural uh, pain and, and trauma, uh, it's my honour to introduce Liz Kipriotis, who has got a doctorate uh, research uh, in the area of uh, paediatric uh, medical trauma and stress. And she's going to talk to us about uh, paediatric medical traumatic stress, recognition, management and prevention. Welcome, Liz. It's disappeared on us. Just before I start, I do want to acknowledge my colleague, Dr. Susie Lord, um, for her contribution to some of the slides. You'll see towards the end there's some graphics and uh, a poster that she whipped up in her spare time for Nova Scotia. So thank you, Susie. Um, another big topic area, I'm afraid, so I'll get going with it. Um, paediatric medical traumatic stress was first uh, identified as an emerging concept in the 1980s. Um, through qualitative studies that were done, and it's since had a growing evidence base looking at it in various contexts, cancer, burns, um, EDs, ICUs, those sort of things. And it's particularly been led by Anne Kazak out of the States. Uh, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network defined it as psychological and physiological responses to encountering threatening, painful or traumatic experiences as a result of injury or illness. And classically, we think about those uh, occurring in healthcare and in children. 
But more and more, as we've heard from Brandon and other speakers, uh, healthcare, particularly in chronic illness, is moving into the home uh, and the family is also being affected. So from where we sit in Newcastle, our, um, our service, uh, I'm just going to give you some sort of reflections, I guess, from our service as well as an, an overview of the literature. For me, uh, it became apparent when I was researching with parents of children who'd been diagnosed with rare diseases. Uh, the parents could state very clearly um, sentinel events that they'd experienced. And the level of trauma was really very apparent in the interviews and, and you could see it and, and their whole demeanour changed when they were talking about these events. Uh, simultaneously, I knew Susie was working with a group of children who had been traumatised as a result of their essential medical care. And when I asked her whether they actually had rare diseases, she said that they did uh, when she thought about it. So we, together we've sort of identified this fairly high-risk group and that's continued throughout our practice when we joined forces in this complex pain service. Um, our experience in the last four years has continued to see that trend of children and families with these rare disorders being particularly um, affected by this. Sorry. Um, so many aspects of illness and injury cause stress, but some aspects have the potential to actually cause trauma. And traumatic stress and its associated emotional rea um, reactions can seriously impair the child's functioning. Ideally, you would get in well before that happened, but uh, it can be very difficult. This website, uh, the National Child uh, Traumatic Stress Network, has some fantastic resources on it if you'd like more information there. Uh, PTSD and paediatric medical traumatic stress uh, are not necessarily synonymous. There's a bit of argument in the literature about this. Uh, but just to give you an idea of incidents, PTSD in uh, 1,400 American youth uh, was identified in 13% of them by the age of 16, and at least 68% 68 had had at least one traumatic event. And of those traumatic events, you could tease out uh, illness, accident, physical assault and sexual assault as things that we might see in the context of health. A large meta-analysis of uh, paediatric medical traumatic stress from 26 studies found that the incidence sat at around 12% of ill children, 20% of injured children and between 5 and 20% of children with cancer, which was increasing with age, so particularly in the um, older survivors, it was noted, and particularly in parents, it was noted. Uh, paediatric medical traumatic stress did sit as a few lines in the DSM-4, but it has disappeared out of the DSM-5. So uh, some of the terminology that you'll see used in the li literature includes acute stress disorder, which are the traumatic stress responses lasting less than a month, as distinct from the post-traumatic stress disordered responses that last more than a month. These stress responses may occur after potentially traumatic events. So exposure to um, actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence, uh, either by directly experiencing that event yourself, through witnessing others experience it, or by learning uh, that somebody close to you has experienced it, an event uh, can leave you predisposed. The sort of things that you'll see in the children presenting to the clinics and possibly in, in families that you're uh, working with, um, the post-traumatic stress symptoms, which is more the terminology of the literature these days uh, in the paediatric medical traumatic stress literature, uh, are intrusive re-experiencing of the trauma and uh, it's in the form of nightmares, flashbacks or intrusive memories and you may see it in terms of repetitive play where themes of that traumatic event are uh, expressed or played out over and over. There may also be persistent avoidance as we've heard today uh, from Hamer, children not wanting to attend clinics if they feel they've been traumatised, not wanting to go near hospitals. So they make effort to avoid memories, thoughts and feelings that have been associated with that event and external reminders of that event. So absolute refusal to get in the car, hiding in cupboards, hiding under beds to try and avoid procedures at home, uh, those sort of uh, symptoms. Negatively altered cognition and mood, whereby uh, some 
youth get a dissociative amnesia, exaggerated negative beliefs and low mood. And uh, hyperarousal, that fight or flight response. And we quite often see children sitting there in clinic with these massively dilated pupils and, and very withdrawn um, look about them. Some of them do actually say they're feeling sick. Most of them look like they really do want to run out of the room. So, yeah, muscle tension, uh, sweating sometimes. Uh, not all trauma leads to bad things. Traumatic growth, uh, trauma can lead to growth, post traumatic growth. Um, but in, in our reflection in working with this over a number of years and thinking about it, uh, it happens more towards growth if you have an opportunity to both re-experience and avoid those sort of memories that you've been dealing with. So if you're able to attend to the memory of the event, uh, try and make some sense of it and, and determine its meaning, uh, integrate it into your current mental frame, and then adapt and evolve your mental framework to accommodate the new experience. Uh, that's a, a good thing and, and more often leads to uh, a good outcome. Equally though, you need to be able to take your attention away from that memory uh, of the event. You need to titrate your exposure to, to the memory so that you can keep the distress manageable. Oops, sorry. And you need to uh, allow yourself some distraction from it. So in healthcare, some of the sort of events that we see are life threat, and I think particularly around the rare diseases where there many are life limiting and life threatening, uh, that comes into play. Uh, again, many of the rare diseases require painful and threatening procedures, but uh, other other illnesses also require this. Where restraints being used, uh, children can become particularly traumatised. Uh, where there's been traumatic injury. Uh, the diagnosis and prognosis, particularly for parents, if it's been uh, a particularly shocking diagnosis with uh, hopelessness associated with it, if it's been delivered in an insensitive way where there's uh, little support offered, um, they can be very traumatised. And many of the parents that I was work worked with uh, expressed great consternation about the delivery of the diagnosis. Uh, for the children, seeing their parents severely distressed uh, put them at higher risk and uh, severe unrelieved pain. And the, the most traumatised parents that I was working with were the parents that were actually uh, required to do the procedures that were quite painful to their own children uh, in, home, in their home. So um, that was another layer of complexity again. So the risk factors for acute stress disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder are being female, being of younger age, having a previous history of trauma, um, being uh, prior behavioural or attention problems, low parental education and not living with biological parents um, decrease the opportunity for m more positive outcomes. Life threat and increased exposures increase the risk for paediatric medical traumatic stress, but maternal presence was a protective factor. So this paper out of the European Journal for Pain um, is good that all of us working in pain know that the shared neurobiology of pain and trauma and the very complex interactions um, that occur there uh, no doubt make this, this paper a, a quite an important one. So they've tried to tease some of it out. So they looked at post-traumatic stress responses in children and adolescents um, with chronic pain um, and did a topic review looking for future research directions. They found that difficulty with peers increases both the risk of paediatric medical traumatic stress and pain. Uh, increased pain intensity and poor control increase the risk for paediatric medical traumatic stress. Cognitive biases such as avoidance, increased catastrophizing and decreased uh, activity, physical function. Hyperarousal interferes with sleep and coping uh, and depression can lead to increased risk for paediatric medical traumatic stress and pain disability. So the key points really are that the subjective experience of a potentially traumatic event determines the development of paediatric medical traumatic stress, not the objective assessment of the event severity. So I might think accessing a port cath is a quick 
relatively straightforward procedure, but a child, one child we worked with was just so terrified of it. Uh, the person withdrawing the blood had said, here comes the snake. And so this child just had horror from that point forward and wouldn't, have, uh, wouldn't allow that um, port to be accessed. Uh, to be traumatic, the, threat, uh, the event must elicit feelings of life threat, fear, helplessness or horror. So Anne Cazette put together a, a model. It hasn't been validated and it didn't work very well when we were trying to think uh, about things uh, reflecting on the children that we were working with. The primary problem is that it's lineal. So you have a, um, your risk factors and you have an objective event that occurs and then there's some early ongoing evolving responses through to the longer term responses. The children we see were just having you know, event after event and it was cycling around. So uh, that model didn't really work very well. What we were seeing was the children were, and, and parents and some of the siblings were experiencing new events at the same time as uh, dealing with cumulative memories. They had inadequate time uh, between the events to integrate and adapt. They uh, found it very difficult to avoid uh, thinking about it or being exposed to it. Much of life, particularly in rare diseases, revolves around the disease and its treatment. There's fewer feasible social and vocational distractions. And parents in particular need to be very, very vigilant uh, of the child and the disease. And really, no matter how resilient, eventually the cumulative burden uh, wore them all, or most of them down. And uh, the psychological morbidity was uh, quite, quite worrying. So this was our model, infinitely more <laughs> complicated and it breaks all the rules of PowerPoint, but I'll put it up just to, to give you an idea of what, what we were talking about. So instead of the three phases, there's four phases and you have in this first uh, mouse, in this first one, risk factors. So has there been past trauma, um, pre-existing psychopathology, the child's future might have been um, perceived as being foreshortened with a life-threatening illness or a life-limiting illness. The procedure might be perceived, perceived as being a threat to the child's future and it might have been unplanned uh, an emer or an emergent procedure. Protective factors here are just a person's intrinsic resilience, the external social supports around them, uh, shared decision making between, in a partnership between the uh, child, the family and the staff. A clear procedural plan is very helpful and a shared understanding of what the condition is, the procedures benefits, what to expect, um, and the motivations of the proceduralists and, and the helpers involved. Everybody needs to be quite positive. Uh, in this second, in the first phase here, which is really the event phase, it's the players. So the, there's the child, usually the parent, and usually a clinician. There's an objective event. Uh, but then that event is processed differently by the different players. So sensations, emotions and cognitions uh, come to the fore and then there's different behaviours which, which are also exhibited. And they interplay amongst themselves. So the child sees how we respond, how the parent responds and so on. From that, it leads across to either integration, if it's gone well, um, acute stress uh, symptoms or acute stress disorder, and then the later responses are similar, um, post-traumatic growth, um, post-traumatic uh, stress symptoms or disorder. Uh, so in terms of how we manage it clinically, down the bottom here, if you can manage the modifiable risk factors, provide in information and preparation through play, improve the family and uh, health communication and relationship and provide really intensive family support in this uh, pre-event phase, you, you have a better chance of good outcomes. Uh, in phase one, where the event's occurring, ensuring that the child and the family have some familiar staff around them, supporting them, reducing the frequency and invasiveness of events if possible, reducing adverse uh, or adverse uh, sensations, pain, sights, sounds, smells by managing the environment, uh, adding analgesia, maybe sedation, maybe anaesthetic in some cases and training staff and parents to exhibit really confident behaviours during that procedure, even in the face of their own stress and distress. Uh, in that early response phase, we need to then embed um, 
early post-procedural talk play and really positively reframe that uh, experience for the child. Some may need formal screening for paediatric medical traumatic stress if you think it's emergent. And all of them need very individualised approaches to um, the interventions that might be needed. And finally, if there are late responses, um, then uh, therapy for those who are deemed most at risk or who are diagnosed as having PTSD-like symptoms. Uh, Trauma-focused CBT is helpful and, again, individualised interventions. So for us, we don't use a screening tool as such from a clinical point of view. We do our usual assessment, plus we explore um, the child and family's past experiences of death or loss, uh, any trauma experiences, particularly where there's been life threat, uh, essential and painful threatening procedures, where are they being done, why are they being done and by whom. Past procedural management, has um, analgesia been used adequately, has restraint been required or used, any sentinel trauma events that the family might have um, experienced. And uh, some of that is done in the intake uh, consultation that I do with the family. So early recognition of paediatric medical traumatic stress is um, a good thing if we can uh, get that early. Uh, education for parents just to let them know it's possible that they themselves might feel uh, that they've been exposed to those sort of threats and risks. Improving the procedural experience as early as possible and every time and that requires a lot of legwork with the various teams sitting down and talking. Um, especially if the teams are in other hospitals, that can be really quite complicated. Uh, an emergency department management plan is a, a great thing to get in place and the family is very much appreciated. Music art, child life therapy are absolutely vital uh, in, in this situation to get a referral to them. And uh, very early therapy if you do detect uh, any acute stress disorder or PTSD. Uh, just very briefly, this little guy had quite bad pain when we, we took on his care. The pain was relatively easily managed. You can see it's gone from that big purple shape down to that tiny little uh, pale purple shape. Uh, similarly, his severe function went down to minimal or no disability, but his emotional function took much, much longer to come back into play. So very small quality of life or impacted quality of life here at referral and improving out, but the emotional side of it was that much more difficult. So he was a little guy who had cardiac problems and wasn't expected to make it past one. He'd read somewhere that people with cardiac problems die in their sleep, so he became very frightened about sleep. If you're doing research, use validated tools. There's some here um, available at this site, and uh, Justin Canardi out of the Queensland University is also a great resource. Thank you. Thanks very much, Liz. Uh, clearly, we, you could have talked for longer on that, uh, but I appreciate you keeping to time. Uh, and then finally, to reduce some of the stimulus with these potentially traumatic events, we've got Kate Austin um, from Royal Children's in Melbourne talking about nurse-led procedural sedation. Thanks, Kate. Thank Thank you, Jordan, and thank you for having me here today. Um, so what does paediatric procedural sedation look like in 2017? Well, what we find up here on the right, we predominantly still have dentists administering nitrous oxide, and they are um, the procedural sedationist and the proceduralist all in the one event. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner, we have Kira Mason and her work around procedural sedation outside of the OR. America are really leading procedural sedation in paediatrics. Uh, a lot of her work, I've attended her conferences uh, in the last couple of years, and there's a lot of work around looking at more complex procedural sedation paediatric uh, patients in terms of uh, obstructive airways and um, use of new agents such as intranasal dexamethasone, looking at childhood obesity and the impact on using procedural sedation for those patients cognitively impaired and ASD patients. So the landscape is shifting in procedural sedation. We also have over here, I've got a picture of 
um, the famous Michael Jackson case. And I also heard Stephen Sheffer talk about, you know, being an expert witness case in the in in that um, in the Michael Jackson case about propofol and the measurements we can do about you know, the amounts and volumes and concentrations of drugs that are being delivered. And, you know, he's doing a lot of work in the domain of um, looking at the medical um, legal um, issues for consent in procedural sedation in paediatrics. Definitely um, one of the players to watch. But we've also got the Society for Paediatric Sedation with Joe Carvero and others setting up a research consortium. And since 2003, they've had a database that now has 300,000 um, sedation events captured and they're able to look at patient outcomes and look at the techniques that are being used. So we've got data now that we can look at, we've got provider courses, we've got conferences. In 2005 at RCH, when we started doing procedural sedation under the banner of Comfort Kids program and training nurses started in 2006, a lot of that didn't exist for the clinical nurse consultant that started this work. Um, I worked with her, Lisa Takas, in 2008 when we started procedural sedation leadership, so looking at train the trainer models to have our nurses trained um, to lead these pro to lead um, in ward and ambulatory areas procedural sedation events and training. Um, so there have been definitely challenges, and I came to the lead role in this nurse-led procedural sedation program in 2015 after a two-year gap in service. And what I will say about nurse-led procedural sedation is you need a driver. If there's no one driving the ship, it's like this elephant here. Things are still moving, things are still happening, but what you're seeing is compliance drift and you're finding that um, with, there's no sustainability of the program. You're losing your sedation trainers, so I needed a bit of a roadmap to run a procedural sedation uh, course. And what I found is that it wasn't much about perfectionism as much as it is about disruption, disrupting what was already occurring. So there was that, that uh, elephant on the move. There was sedation still occurring all across ward and ambulatory areas. However, the way that staff were being trained was really just a watch model do as opposed to having formal training program. And looking at all the, the headings that I just have there are the steps that we had to go through. We had to look at our resources. You need to be resource heavy. You need to have um, foundation knowledge across the organisation. And you need to look at new technologies and innovation. We've shifted from when this work started 12 years ago. Uh, lots of things around mitigating risk and moving into SIM-based education. That's what our colleagues are doing across the waters and we really need to, to move there. So the way I started was with using a logic model, and I apologise, that's not particularly clear, but the idea of a logic model is to keep your end user and your consumers front and centre, to work in partnership so that you can identify the gaps in your organisation and you can set short and long-term goals that are measurable. It helped also with the issue of where to start this journey, so I could look at a goal that I had in the organisation, what resources we had, um, and you know, develop rationales for Roundup why I was going to do that. So whenever I got stuck or I was approached with the program of where are you at, because it was very much a I want it now approach, I could go, well, I'm here in the model. I'm working on, I'm going over and doing a training in procedural sedation, paediatric procedural sedation. I'm now doing training in uh, simulation to get simulation skills so I can write scenarios and run a simulation-based education program so that you could also feed back to your stakeholders where you're at with this work. But like, lots of lessons learnt along the way, quite challenging. And at the same time that I was handed the role, within a month in the role, I was sitting at um, a table where the work on the old guideline, the original procedural sedation guideline from 2005, was then mandated by um, nursing exec that, uh, that this needs to be a procedure, that we can no longer just have simple recommendations, that we need to have um, mandatory uh, information that, that has to be followed, that we can't have holes in the system, um, you know, like the Swiss cheese where we have too many human factors coming into play and then end up with adverse events. So we took the guideline, got stakeholders from across the organisation, so wards like the cardiac ward where they give IV midazolam incrementally um, for 
to patients for procedural sedation, to um, nurses from radiology, to day medical where they would do high-end complex patients and use a lot of nitrous oxide. We got these um, nurses around the table. Some of them had been delivering procedural sedation for 10 years and we sat and we did a body of work around taking a guideline into becoming a procedure. And then after 10 years of delivery at the Royal Children's, what could we, what did we need to do? What were the new requirements? What did nurses need to know? And what came apparent very quickly is a lot around the language, that we weren't talking about a continuum of sedation. And even talking about procedural sedation, that nurses sometimes did not understand what the objective was. So we need to go back, we needed to go back and look at what is your target? Is it anxiolysis? Is it amnesia? Do you need to provide analgesia? So getting nurses to think about what the end goal was that they wanted for the child. Um, getting a common language about what can nurses do in these areas when they deliver sedation. So on the continuum, we operate on the minimal to moderate scale and what the implications was of deep sedation and where and how you might end up at um, the stage of deep sedation. So we're really about anxiolysis and conscious sedation and what that meant to nurses. And they, they really liked having a lot more language around what we did. It was very clear that they wanted that before, during and after approach, very systematic. We're all, I'm an ICU nurse, so I'm very driven by checklists as well, but I found across the board that nurses wanted information very simply. But they wanted to also know about failure to sedate. They said, Kate, you as the expert in the room, you need to tell us what to do when sedation fails. And a month into the role, I sort of went, the expert in the room, okay, you know, big shoes to fill there. But what it really came down to was a lot of things of looking at human factors. Was it the wrong drug? Was it that we didn't line all the ducks up? You know, that we gave the agent too early, that the proceduralists, the, the sedationists, they didn't stick to their roles. So it, it wasn't actually that hard of work once we started to pull things apart. Also, staff really wanted escalation and more um, confirmation around consultation. Who do we consultate and when? And also, when can we send kids home safely? They, they were aware of some of the reports of, from over in the States of children being sent home and having had chloral and then falling asleep and obstructing in the back of the car, in the car seat. So we wanted to make sure that we were keep getting things airtight again and closing loops but first, we wanted to disrupt their focus on procedural sedation because a lot of nurses on the wards find it very sort of sexy to go, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get nitrous accredited. That's what I want to do. And I'm a clinical nurse consultant now, and I want to be a sedation trainer. And then you talk to them and you'd ask them about, so how are you going in generally with your procedures and how much nitrous oxide do you get to deliver? Oh, not very often. We don't do much on our ward. So there was a lot of work to be done around... Um, taking people back a step. And the first step to take them back to really was non-farm, as we've just been hearing. You've got to have a good plan to start with. Sedation completely falls down without a good support plan, without taking all the steps first, having all the team on board, knowing their roles. So we're lucky um, at the Royal Children's, we've had the um, EPIC, the electronic medical records are now all um, up and going. So we can have this all built in to a computerised system so that when a child comes in and out of hospital, we can flag these procedural support plans to the patient's name and then you can then when a child in... Um, because, you know, obviously with nurses being busy and if we think about children coming into ED, it's busy. If you can see there's a procedural support plan, you can quickly look into that. You can find out who the contacts are and what's needed and you can bring in the, the right support people or know which agents did and didn't work. So checklist-wise, we got pretty heavy on that. Um, and the part that um, nurses really wanted to know is they wanted a lot more information around well, OK, it's a risk and some of it's um, relative and some of it's absolute, but, what, but why, but why, and but what if? There was lots of whys and what ifs. So we worked a lot on trying to answer some of those questions about what it means and why you wouldn't proceed to sedate. Um, nurses also wanted to know a lot more about how to assess an airway and get a, a very focused history to ask the right questions early around... 
um, previous experience of the child, things that might play into the whole sedation event around um, being uh, having behavioural issues, becoming combative, uh, past experiences that have been negative, such as restraint. So we wanted to make it very clear that, that there were resources that were easy to access and that you could go and get the information and learn how to proceed. The other thing I discovered in the role was walking through the hospital is that you have equipment that goes with your procedural sedation and you do some auditing and, you know, Sleek is a nurse's best friend but sometimes used rather inappropriately. And so despite the fact that we had a fantastic model when we got nitrous plumb throughout the hospital, beautiful model, beautiful manual was developed, I still went to accredit nurses and I'd say, now, on the Porter MXR, show me the safety checks, show me the fail-safe, how can this machine, show me how it doesn't run without oxygen. And they go, oh, really no. And I'm like, okay, I can't accredit you today. We can still do a sedation, we can model, we can do it together in partnership, but I can't accredit you if you don't know this machine. So doing simple little visual cards, got to make it quick and easy and accessible. But that has really helped in a nurse-led program to shift behaviours. Um, the other thing we were able to disrupt was the way that we ordered procedural sedation. So we have a lot of adult doctors come through and junior medical doctors who just say to us, I have no idea what to write up for a child. The nurses tell me what to give. So we worked with what we had with our technology with having um, EPIC and developed procedural sedation order sets. Now, we could very much be extending what agents we're using and, and follow America, but we wanted to get the foundations right again. Um, and the nice thing about this was just to be a bit prescriptive and then also build it in another closing the loop that when the medication's ordered in this way, it then activates what we have developed, which is a sedation narrator which is the order set for the nurses of, for what they're to do. And this narrator is really an old, came from a record of sedation, paper form, you fill in, you do all your checklists pre-sedation. Um, and the good part about, you know, it's not as elegant as we thought we would be, it's not as, um, hasn't got as many hard stops as I would like, but we're now getting to collect some data around what staff are doing and being able to prompt them and assist them with real-time information. So when they use this um, narrator, they get little tips, you can see in the red here, about why they would or wouldn't do. And this all is um, then supported in the governing procedure. So it's all the same information, but in a different format. And if they use the checklist and they hit yes and something is deemed a risk, then it comes up in red and then what they usually, they then can do is seek consultation and make a comment as to why they would proceed. So really we're capturing some nice data around the actual sedation events, how it went. So again, like the procedural support plan, when a child represents to the hospital, we can have a look and go, okay, in this event, um, the child was already on some oxycodone and clonidine. However, the sedation score was zero, so we proceeded um, but what we found in summary was we only had to give one dose of intranasal fentanyl. It actually went really well with play therapy and other non-pharmacological techniques. Um, and we also are looking forward to capturing and using this to get some real data and set up our own, like the research consortium, you've got to start crunching some data and looking at you know your outcomes and adverse events. Um, I think, you know, we're not yet there yet. This is new. As I say, we only started this technology um, this year. So we're still working forward, looking forward to be able to collect some data. And sorry, I just. So the part of, with procedural sedation is that when you run a nurse led program, you really need to keep reassessing your goals. You've got to keep focused on the end user, be collaborative keep your resources updated. Um, but really, it's about going where, if you've got an existing program, it's going back to the trainers and listening to those that actually do the work. So our trainers. And this was one of the dilemmas I had, was managing their expectation. 
they're very focused on numbers. We need this many trainers on this in this particular department or ward. And so you struggle with that managing that expectation with doing it well, doing an, a really good, broad hospital program. Because this is specialist training. And I think we have to look very carefully at who our trainers should be in an organisation. So it's first asking how, who, what. But the trainers are very clear. They want realistic experiences um, and they want to feel confident and competent. <coughs> So by discovering the issues for the trainers, what I did is ran a little research project focus group and got trainers in the room. And what we found is it was good. We had shared goals. They wanted standardisation and a structured program. They wanted to feel confident and competent in their delivery first before they trained others, which I thought was quite revealing given that they were... Um, procedural sedation leaders. They'd had a half day training course or a day somewhere in the last 10 years. Um, they hadn't had much follow up other than what they'd done themselves and that that was a glaring gap in what that they want in a practice gap that they wanted filled. But I thought that was quite powerful that they first needed to be confident and competent. So now when I go and talk to new trainers and they say, yeah, yeah, I want to be a procedural sedation, Kate, when are you running train the trainer? then I'll have a discussion about how they feel about their own skills and knowledge. Um, the nice part of this work was that the content really was where the gaps are that they felt that what they wanted and it aligned really nicely with the resources that we have within the organisation so we can deliver this. And the big push really was into simulation. Is that why are we practising procedural sedation events anyway on children, on wards? Why aren't we doing it in sim-based and then taking it and doing it in situ? So um, the work that looking at that too is taking what we have already in accreditation competencies and putting them into uh, checklists that we can test in the sim environment and have peer-to-peer -peer review where procedural sedation trainers can actually review each other, um, debrief, get skills around um, challenging and escalation and they can assess their own confidence and see their own shifts. But this is all very well to start SIM-based education. Um, it, it just needs the follow through and partnership into your, cha your champions or your sedation leaders actually then being followed up on the ward and developing simulations that are clinically relevant. For example, the burns unit doing a burns bar simulation with the nurses at work on that ward who ha are the subject experts in burns and scaffolding it all with the non-pharmacological approaches and the procedural sedation and then running it on the ward with the staff, much like the basic life support models are running. So I've got good programs that I can model on within the organisation. So really I found with doing this work it was about flipping it. Um, we've spent a lot of time just rolling out in the last two years of foundation, and that's your non-pharmacological and your procedural sedation principles, uh, getting people accredited just in delivery, and then working very um, specifically on the trainer model of getting it right for the end user, but then also benchmarking it to what's happening overseas with simulation education. The governance is a tricky part. We're a very small team, um, and within our organisation we're quite lucky you've got to look at who gives sedation regularly and who's going to be good at this as a nurse we have emergency nurses that are nurse practitioners that are now working after hours coordination shifts as nurse coordinators and they are going onto the wards and modelling and driving and leading procedural sedation so we're quite fortunate with our leadership and governance that we've got that group um, our ultimate aim really is to provide a positive patient experience and with any good procedural pain management, you've got to do as much as you can on the non-pharmacological. It really does trump procedural sedation. Um, in particular, we're lucky our play therapists have developed videos on all sorts of procedures. So I've got many children across the line and encourage nurses to do the same by watching a simple video of a child coming to day medical unit to have nitrous oxide. Um, Equally, um, ED doctors and play therapists have written uh, guidelines around communicating procedures to 
families. And my colleague Karen Plummer here in the front row has written this marvellous guideline with the principles of procedural pain management. And all I'd like to say, I haven't finished, sorry, um, is that within this work, you know, it is it challenging. Um, you, if you are ambitious enough to get out there and do nurse-led procedural sedation, you need to be well equipped in terms of staffing and funding um, and resource. You, it is very resource uh, intensive. What you do need to do is be as innovative as you can and use the technology. And I think that the future really, I, with procedural sedation, I think the drugs, you know, they're only as good as the preparation and planning that we do. Uh, I think the language that we use is essential to get that right. Uh, and there's a lot of work around that and we'll be hearing from Alan in, after the break on that and on clinical hypnosis, which um, Karen is also using with children who have been as we've just heard from Elizabeth, traumatised from procedures and have high procedural anxiety. I think there are two areas to really look at is the language and what we can do before we sedate. Thank you. Oh, this is all tying in so well, finally, with the piste de resistance, later in with the language. Um, can I have all the speakers up here, please? Um, and we'll have questions. So we have 15 minutes for questions, and then we've got to go downstairs, and then 15 minutes of downstairs, and 15 minutes, and then uh, uh, afternoon tea. Can I take this uh, opportunity, just before everyone runs away, to remind everybody that um, there's two sessions in the next two days at 1.30, which are very worthwhile attending. Uh, Susie Lord is going to speak at 1.30 tomorrow with Hilary Tardiff and Fiona Blythe on a fantastic session championing uh, young people's pain. And uh, then at 1.30 on Tuesday, we have the free paper paediatric session as well. So I've been fairly uh, vocal with the scientific program committee trying to get some paediatric sessions within the main body of the conference rather than just having a pre-conference workshop. Um, and one other thing, can everyone please be back here at uh, 3.30 exactly so that we can start on time for the workshop? 3.30, in an hour's time. Okay, questions? That's called a picker stack. And it was invented, I think, in the 70s to keep um, toddlers still to have chest x-rays. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no. No, clearly to the left is an example of what not to do. I, because they're all at the end, I've got a couple of questions. Can I have more than one go? Yes. <laughs> Certainly. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, just on the first speaker, um, just a suggestion. What you've got there is a, um, is a, a mean trajectory, right? So what you alluded to was the fact that some individuals actually didn't recover and, uh, but on average they did. So what I, I suggest you might think about doing is separating out those individuals who actually don't recover and try and predict those and try and predict who's actually going to be in that trajectory as opposed to just looking at predicting the, the, the actual average line. And there are really good statistical techniques that you can use to do that. So um, uh, I... I think that might, a lot of people are going in that direction too in this sort of work. Um, <coughs> on the um, traumatic stress, one of the things that I would think is, is really important is to think, you, you, you alluded to it, is that you've got clinicians, parents and patients. What I think is missing is what do you do with the clinicians? <laughs> and um, uh, one of the models that might be useful to think about is this uh, uh, Keith Petrie's health beliefs model, 
which is uh, which thinks about how um, not just patients, including parents and kids, but also clinicians view the uh, experiences and the uh, um, circumstances around an illness and see where there are mismatches between parents, between clinicians and, and the families. Because I think that's an object or a focus where you can actually start to have a conversation with clinicians about promoting better outcomes. It's just kind of really a nice model and it's really well, well developed. And sorry, one more, sorry, <laughs> is on the, on the notion of um, sedation. Um, there's two, two things I wonder about with sedation. One is, is whether we're at a point where we can think about um, pre-procedural um, uh, profiling to know whether certain types of sedation are actually um, deleterious, have poorer outcomes than others. Um, and I think there's literature, there's plenty of literature out there that suggests that, that some of the more commonly used sedations like Chlorohydrate, for example, are a particular have particular risks for uh, certainly for certain individuals, but uh, uh, broadly. And and uh, I would have thought that we need to know a lot more about um, about those those kinds of matchups and, and risk factors. But also secondary to that is that uh, what what we can do that actually can intervene on, on an early intervention way post-sedation to try and prevent long-term uh, uh, sequelae of adverse effects following sedation. Because we know that there are, again, that there are certain sedation agents that seem to have um, deleterious effects down the track, um, particularly when they seem to be associated with uh, delirium in, in patients. Yes. Where they create delirium tends to seem, seems to facilitate a poorer um, outcome. So I think those two those are the two areas that I think are really important: pre pre sedation profiling, and and post sedation follow up and 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 um, intervention to try and prevent those outcomes. Thank you. So th three comments there. Does anybody want to reply? Uh, Thank you very much for the suggestions. Really appreciate. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. I'm just, oh, yeah. Was, um, you mentioned that um, um, uh, re regarding a, a study, um, the clinician you conducted a study there in the second uh, What was that? We've increased our model, we're not the least one, where he has um, uses of not, not only to understand um, patients. Any other questions, comments? Sorry, if you wouldn't mind just uh, saying your name and your background so that we can, everyone can hear you, please. Sorry, my name's Susan Henderson. I'm a psychologist, I specialise in trauma and pain. Uh, for the first speaker, I was just wondering, in regards to your study when you were talking about parental behaviours, what exactly was that? And I'm wondering if that was about parental behaviours towards the children in terms of the parental behaviour might affect how the children respond to the pain, perceive the pain, so on. Is, is that what you were talking about or was it something else? So it's a combination of a few of those factors, that being one of the factors. So things that we're looking at are, for example, how parental attitude behaviours and uh, will affect the pain outcomes in terms of whether they, for example, pain catastrophizing in the parents may cause the children to exhibit certain kind of behaviors which can cause adverse pain outcomes. Or for example, um, like referring back to the medical attitude, me medication attitude, when it could directly cause them to withhold treatment leading to worse outcome directly. 
So there'll be a range of um, parental characteristics that we'll be looking at in the near future. And ho we're hoping that some of those will be able to help us uh, successfully predict the children's pain outcome. So if I can comment briefly, Brandon is really presenting on pain trajectory uh, today, uh, but other student who worked with him, Genevieve, will also be presenting at the ISPP in Malaysia in a few months' time on a lot more of these uh, parental beliefs and background risk factors for poor outcomes. So we have a session planned with Michelle Fortier from um, uh, Seattle, who's uh, going to be talking as well on their experience with persistent pain. So. Any questions, comments? Should we go outside? Okay, thank you very much.